Chapter Eleven of the Outdoor Chums in the Big Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outdoor Chums in the Big Woods by Captain Quincy Allen. Chapter Eleven Facing Trouble. After all, no hunting party started out that afternoon. Jerry probably ate too heartily of the midday meal, for he complained of pains in his stomach, and guessed he had better lie around the rest of the day. He wanted Bluff and Frank to go, but the former was busy doctoring his heel, while Frank would not break the rule he had set and go alone. Besides, Frank remarked as he once more put his rifle away inside the cabin and hefted the axe, as though meaning to have another spell with the firewood, We've still plenty of that venison on hand. Tomorrow will do just as well. And so it was settled. Of course, that did not mean they expected to be idle the remainder of the day, for none of them liked to do nothing. Jerry and Will were gone a little while after the former had recovered from his indisposition. We found a place where I think a fox passes along a trail, Jerry announced on their return, and tonight Will means to try and take his picture. I should think a fox would make a good one if only you get him as well as you did the wolf. And I'm much obliged to you for helping me, Jerry, said Will earnestly. Oh, that's all right, was the reply. It's beginning to get interesting, and I can see how a fellow could easily develop a hobby like this. It means matching your wits against the shyness and cunning of these little animals, said Will proudly. When you've succeeded in getting their pictures, in spite of everything, you feel that you've done something more than just aiming a gun and pulling a trigger. Bluff shrugged his shoulders. He had his own opinion about that. But, of course, Will could never understand the thrill that comes to the sportsman when he is tracking his quarry and has to meet the cunning or ferocity that is common heritage of all wild animals. But Frank knew all about it and met Bluff's look with a smile and a nod. "'Everyone to his taste, Bluff,' Frank said. "'We can't all of us expect to be crazy over taking pictures.' And at the same time it would be queer if every man wanted to be out in the woods all the time with a gun on his shoulder as we do But I can understand how will feels and in a small way share his pleasure What was it you were telling us Frank about the mink that live along the bank of the creek just below the cabin asked Jerry Only that you can find some interesting tracks there and see how the little rascals travel about from one hole to another if you care to step down with me now, we'll look things over. And perhaps I might get a good chance to take some of the tracks, so as to remember what sort of a print a mink makes, observed Will, tucking his camera under his arm. Shall I step in and get my gun, Frank? asked Bluff. If you want to, though we're not going to be out of sight of the cabin at any time, I should think. And thus it came about that none of them carried any weapon. It could hardly be conceived that one would be required under any circumstances when within a stone's throw of the home camp and with all present Frank had such an interesting way of showing anything he seemed to know all about the habits of the mink They live along the banks of streams Frank said as they prowled about examining the various tracks and can swim and dive almost like an otter They're not as destructive to game fish as the otter though I've been told all those animals badger fisher mink and otter are hunted for far and wide by trappers and even weasels and muskrats have pelts that bring fair prices why said bluff i've read that even the common rat skin is being used now because there's a scarcity of furs moles have always been fine for gloves i know that bunch of tracks seems plain enough to make a fine picture with the sunlight shining on the place let me get it and Will proceeded to carry out his idea. He had just clicked his shutter when Jerry said in a low tone, Great Governor, Frank, is that one of the wolves over yonder? Of course, they all looked in the direction Jerry pointed, and it goes without saying that more than one of the boys felt nervous upon remembering that no one had brought a gun along. Then Frank spoke up, and his voice as well as his words went a long way towards stilling their alarm. That's no wolf, boys. I'd rather say it might be a dog. He seems to have come upon a hole in the ground and has got some sort of animal cornered. Listen to him bark as he digs with his forepaws. And see the dirt fly, will you, as well as the snow, observed Bluff. 
But say, Frank, seems to me we know that cur. Yes, we've met him before, Frank admitted. It's Nackerson's beast, then, suggested Jerry. No doubt about it, he was informed by Frank, who still watched the excited dog, digging and thrusting his nose as far down in the burrow as he could. Better take care, Carlo, or you may get a nip from the claws or the teeth of your game. It seemed as though Frank must have been a prophet, for hardly had these words left his lips than the dog gave utterance to a howl and started to run away as fast as his legs could carry him. We oui, that must have taken him square on the nose, ejaculated Jerry. And didn't he put his tail between his legs in a hurry, though? Bluff asked. That's always a sign a dog is whipped. How about it, Frank? What are you looking so serious about? Only this, came the reply. Where that dog is, there's a chance of the men being, too. And that caused them to exchange glances. And sure enough, Jerry hastily remarked, there they come, breaking through the brush, all three loaded down with birds as though they'd been having sport somewhere, though none of us heard any firing this morning. No use trying to make the cabin, is there, Frank? They happen to be between it and us, Will observed, with a catch to his voice, although he would possibly have indignantly denied being frightened had anyone shown the temerity to accuse him. It seemed as though Nackerson and his companions must have discovered the four outdoor chums almost as soon as they themselves were seen. At any rate, they were even then starting toward the boys. He looks pretty huffy, doesn't he, Frank? Will asked in a troubled tone. Like as not he thinks we kicked his dog and sent him off howling, ventured Bluff, which it turned out was exactly what the other did believe. Frank did not like the situation. He would have felt relieved had some of them been in possession of weapons with which to stand up for their rights. Some men of ungovernable temper act first and do their thinking afterward. The dog was trotting at the heels of his master, every now and then stopping to paw at his muzzle, which Frank could see at a glance was bleeding freely. As the big man came up to the boys, possibly noting that none of them carried a gun, he was scowling. Which one of you cubs kicked my dog? he growled. I've got a good notion not to wait to find out, but start in and give you a licking all around, so as to be sure to strike the right one. Frank looked him straight in the eye. If his heart was thumping faster than usual, one never would have known it from the deliberate way in which he spoke. At the same time there was a calm dignity in his manner, and he tried not to make his words seem like a defiance. I wouldn't try anything like that if I were you, Mr. Nackerson. We have had nothing to do with your dog getting hurt and none of us either kicked him or threw a stone at him. "'That's one of your lies, youngster,' snarled the hunter. "'It's the simple truth. But didn't we hear him yelping like a crazy thing, and didn't he come running to me straight from here? Tell me I haven't got eyes to see. You're going to pay dearly for that kick, understand me?' "'Let me tell you what happened,' continued Frank steadily, at the same time watching the man closely, for he feared the other might strike him. I wouldn't believe anything you might tell me, answered the other with a sneer in his voice that caused Bluff to grit his teeth and wonder whether the stick he held in his hand would be heavy enough to use as a club in case of necessity. Go on, boys, urged one of the companions of Nackerson, who perhaps had a grain of common sense in his makeup, and realized that it was only fair that they should allow the boys a hearing. We were down here looking after some mink that used this bank, Frank continued. You can see their tracks here and there all around. Our chum, who has a camera, was taking some pictures when we discovered an animal close by, which at first sight looked something like a wolf, for we heard wolves howling last night. Nackerson moved a trifle uneasily at the mention of wolves. It afterward turned out that once he had been treed by a pack of those animals, and came very near freezing to death during a long night's vigil. Then we saw that it was a dog, continued Frank. He seemed to be trying to dig out some animal whose scent he has been following. All of a sudden the dog set up a screech and went away on the jump with his tail between his legs. A fierce old buck mink in that burrow had given him a nasty dig along his nose with his teeth or his claws. Nackerson sneered again, while his ugly face looked more scowling than ever. A likely yarn, he said angrily. Take a look at your dog's nose and perhaps you'll see the scratches there, because he's bleeding now. Bluff broke in, unable longer to refrain from having a hand in the game. Nackerson showed no sign of bothering himself, but one of his cronies bent over the dog which whined when he touched its lacerated muzzle. 
He'd been badly scratched all right, Bill, was the report. If you want any more proof, Frank went on coolly, take a look over by that bush yonder. That's where we saw him digging first. You'll likely find there's a burrow with the snow and dirt thrown out. Yes, added Bluff. And if you look sharp, perhaps now you'll discover a few specks of blood on the snow along the trail the dog made when he skipped out. No one took the trouble to find out. The two men with Nackerson must have already been convinced that the boys were not guilty. As for the big hunter, he did not wish to put himself in a place where he might have to admit that he had wronged them. Don't believe a word of it, I tell you, he persisted, as though bent on making trouble. You've got a pretty slick tongue, youngster, but you can't fool me. I cut my eye teeth long ago. I suppose you are a gentleman of considerable experience in the woods, Frank observed, still hoping to conciliate the man, who he saw had already been making a liberal use of his pocket flask, as usual. But we've told you only the truth, and say again that your dog was not harmed by us. Then there was that nasty business aboard the train, continued Nackerson, when you purposely upset that heavy pack on his back. Seems like you've taken a spite against my dog, and he never harmed you that I know of. I wanted to teach you cubs a lesson right then, but my friends held me back. Now you've gone and done another mean trick. Frank did not answer. He saw it would be useless, for the man was only working himself up to a pitch, where in his rage he might attempt an attack. The boy, on the contrary, was wondering just what he and his chums might do, should they actually be set upon. "'Hold my gun, Whalen,' said the giant hunter, turning to one of the others. "'Now don't you dare say a word to me about not laying a hand on these troublesome kids. I'll teach them a lesson they won't soon forget.' Frank shut his jaws hard. Bluff edged up alongside as though it was his earnest desire to be on the firing line if there was going to be trouble. At that critical moment, a voice was heard saying, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Bill Nackerson. Looking in the direction whence these words came, Frank saw with the liveliest satisfaction that the speaker was no other than Mr. Darrell, the lumberman. End of chapter 11